Hi, my name is Dirk Smith. I'm an adventure travel filmmaker. I am also the content creator for Iron Man 4x4 Africa. So normally we start these stories chronologically, but we're at the end of our journey now, so I'm going to flip it a bit. But we met up with a guy called Dr. Philip Calcott, and he does research on the most incredible, sneaky little animals called the Aardvark. We met up with Dr. Philip just outside of Falwater in the Limpopo province. I'm Philip Calcott and um, I do research on Aardvark and uh, we're here on Bellevue Farm uh, in the beautiful Waterberg. Okay, so we're here trying to find Manala, um, our Aardvark that has a, a, transmit, a VHF transmitter on. And um, we've been lucky today, we found her. She's about 150 meters away from here. Um, she can lead us on a merry dance because she actually moves, we find she moves really quite large distances on a night and she can settle in quite far away locations, um, further away than we initially anticipated. So we have to try and find her and uh, we do that using the VHF transmitter that is on her uh, and we have this directional antenna and this little receiver here. Um, and one of the challenges is that as she moves, the signal changes and it also changes polarization. So at the moment, I'm pointing straight at her and you can't hear anything probably. There we go. So at the moment, the signal is mostly polarized in the vertical direction here. So that's another challenge in just finding her. But uh, we've got her, so uh, we should be able to move in and hopefully watch her emerge as the sun sets. So my, my interest in aardvarks really started, perhaps as, as many of us do, you just notice there are these holes everywhere and they're such an important part of the, of the environment here. And one just wonders what makes those, you know? And you ask around and, and no one really knows, or put it this way, they do know, but they can't show you the creature that makes them, um, unlike most of the animals in, in the bushveld. Um, so I think just got fascinated by aardvark and the more I, um, looked into them, the more I realized how absolutely essential they were for the ecosystem. And then of course, started being introduced to them and spotting one or two. Um, and it just grew from there. And when I discovered how little we know about these creatures, um, if you talk to experts in the field, almost any question you ask them, they'll say, well, we don't really know. You know, what's the breeding period of the Alvars? Well, we don't even really know if they have one. You know, it's, there's so much that we don't know about such a fascinating and important creature um, that I realized we needed to have a research project on them. So you can see which hole she's in there. Um, a very unprepossessing hole. No signs of spore, no sand sprayed out of it, which we normally see. The only reason we know she's in there is because of the transmitter we've got in there. Now, let me show you where she is exactly. So this is about where she is. So yeah, you can even pick up pretty much her exact position underneath the soil by just seeing the maximum signal with the antenna off and just using the receiver on its own. So she's under there right now. The aardvark obviously um, feeds off ants and termites. So it's a very specialized creature uh, you know, you get your generalists in, in the bush, like your baboons or whatever, but the aardvark is all about one thing. It's all about finding, consuming ants and termites. And because of that, it's, its body is very specialized. So every part of the aardvark's body is really designed to fulfill this mission of finding and, and eating ants and termites. Um, 
<clears throat> so for example, it, it has more olfactory bulbs than any other mammal, which probably means it has the most sensitive sense of smell of any mammal. Um, obviously it has this amazing tongue for hoovering up your, your ants. It has nostrils that it can close when it gets up close to ants or termites. So you don't really want termites going up your nose, do you? Well, what a wonderful little adaptation. Uh, it's got the most amazing feet. So if you wanted to dig and I came to you and I said, you've got two options. You can have a pick or a spade and you've got to dig yourself a hole in some difficult terrain. Which would you choose? Well, the aardvark doesn't have to choose because it has both. Its front legs have claws that work rather like a pick and its back legs work rather like a shovel. And even its tail gets involved in helping uh, remove the soil. So everything about an aardvark is just designed to deal with <clears throat> finding and eating ants and termites. And this makes them a fascinating example of specialization in nature, but it also makes them an incredibly important animal. They're one of the main <clears throat> control factors on the populations of ants and termites, that's probably quite important. But even more important than that are the holes they dig. So I don't think we realize the importance of the holes the aardvark dig. So many other creatures utilize them as accommodation. So where does your warthog live? Lives in an aardvark hole. Where does your bat-eared fox live? Lives in an aardvark hole. Where does your rock python live? In an aardvark hole. There's a whole range of species that basically utilize aardvarks as free construction agents. They make their homes for them. And so I've got this hypothesis that in actual fact, the aardvark is the most important species, animal species in the whole of Africa. Okay, so this is a 620 nanometer LED. So it's just red light. It's not white light with a filter. Um, aardvarks have got very poor eyesight anyway, but they're particularly bad in the red. So basically, she doesn't see this. She completely ignores this, but it helps the humans to see what's going on. So now basically we sit and wait and hope she's not feeling too lazy tonight. If you imagine taking a single species out of the African ecosystem, say, you know, remove your lion or something like that, for almost every species you can think of, there are other species that can fill that ecological role. You know, you remove your lions, you've still got leopards and wild dogs and hyenas and whatever. The aardvark is unique. If you take it out of the ecosystem, there's nothing else that digs these amazing holes. Even other ant-consuming digging creatures, take your pangolin, they're actually not strong enough diggers to even dig their own holes. They actually utilize aardvark holes as well. So you've got this dependency that uh, I like to think of them almost like Atlas holding up the ecosystem of Africa because you take them away and you can have warthogs wandering around with nowhere to sleep. You can have rock pythons looking for a hole and there isn't a hole. So <clears throat> I think there's a very strong case that they are the most important single species in the whole of Africa. And interestingly enough, that actually is reflected uh, in their place in the animal kingdom as well. Um, there are something like 6,395 mammal species in the world, and there are 14, six, no, 19, sorry, 19 mammalian orders that they all fit into. Some, most orders you can do the sums on average have, on average have something like 300 species per order. But there's one order that only has one single member. It's the, it's the order Tubula dentata and has just the one member, Erythropus afra. Afa, the African burrowing foot, our aardvark. Um, so its uniqueness uh, is shown in, in both of those ways. It's, it's the only species that has an entire order to itself and it has no other close relatives and the job it does is completely unique in the animal kingdom as well. Okay, so I'm leaving the directional antenna and receiver on because what's happening now is Manala is sleeping down the hole behind the backfill. So when she goes in, she scrapes a pile of sand um, to sort of partially block the tunnel, we think as a sort of protective measure against predators. And the first, the first thing she does when she wakes up, is does a bottom of kissy and then starts to excavate that backfill. And by listening to the strength of the beeps on the receiver, you can pick up that she's moving because the transmitter changes its orientation to you. So it'll go quiet and loud and quiet, and then as she's actually coming out, it'll go quite a bit louder. And so it sort of primes you 
to get ready to watch for emergence, which is really useful because if you've been sitting here for an hour, you may be not concentrating on 100% at the precise moment when she emerges and she's out and you miss her. Okay, so Manala came out at about 10 to seven, and it was actually quite cute because you just see the ears coming up first, and then she came out, she did a little turn around and headed off towards the north, and then there was this tiny, tiniest little click of noise, and she just, just bolted. She's got such incredibly sensitive um, hearing, but I think, well, we got a lovely view of her tonight. Yeah, so Arvark, are a challenging species to study, which I think is why they're so understudied. Um, seeing they have got this critical important role in the ecosystem, it's surprising how little we know about them. Um, and I think the reason is because they're a really difficult beast to study. So firstly, they're nocturnal. Secondly, they've got this incredibly good sense of smell. They've got incredibly good hearing, as we discovered last night. And um, though their eyesight's not very good at night, that's obviously not a problem. So. If you're looking for aardvark at night, they've absolutely got the advantage over you. If they don't want to encounter you, they'll pick you up a long way before you can pick them up and they'll just disappear quietly uh, into the bush. So that makes them difficult to study. Um, and what one does is one has to try and gain an advantage on them, I guess, in the studying um, through putting a transmitter on them so you can locate them. Because if you're having to try and locate your animal for fresh, every single night, it's just not gonna work. So <clears throat> what we do is we, we catch them and then put uh, a transmitter on them and then we can follow them. We can begin to habituate them so they can get used to the presence of a human, which makes all the data collection uh, so much easier. And then, then you can start to get some real data. So ideally what we'd want to do is, is follow an aardvark for an entire night uh, up close, if you could, and for example, record all of the little scrapes and digs it does, and all of the different ant and termite species it eats for that night. Um, you can only really do that if you've got a transmitter on them and you can follow them closely. So that's sort of one of the goals we're aiming towards. Um, we've got Manala, our first aardvark, and we're working to habituate her. She lets us come pretty close to her now, but she's not fully habituated yet. We're hoping that's that's still going to come. Um, but already we're getting some really interesting data about her and finding some some rather unusual things about her behavior that nobody had really discovered before. Um, so our aim is, is to fill the gaps in, in the knowledge of these really critical creatures. So our website's uh, waterbirdcottages.co.za um, and if people would like to get involved in the Aardvark project, um, do get in touch, uh, can come uh, for a few days, come for a week, whatever, get involved. We'll almost certainly be able to introduce you to an aardvark. Um, we'll certainly be able to introduce you to aardvark droppings. Um, you can get involved in collecting those and uh, yeah, help us with our project. At Ironman 4x4, we are passionate about conservation. 